Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for December the 4th, 2020. This is episode number 35. Today, we'll be talking about charging networks, the Ford Mustang Mach-E Performance Edition debuts, the Nikola Badger deal is dead, Hyundai's next-gen next EV platform has been revealed, I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, Inside EVs editor and YouTube and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge with Tom Malogny. We also have uh, Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec Studios YouTube channels. Um, he also puts together our superb videos for the Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And finally, uh, we have a special guest today, uh, for a little while at least. Dedrick Roper is the Director of Public and Private Partnerships for ChargePoint, and we'll be talking to him uh, for a bit about public charging. So welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. So uh, let's kick this thing off by talking about public charging. Uh, some people can charge their cars in their driveways and garages, but if they want to drive beyond the range of the car, if they have to park in the street or in a parking lot somewhere without anything to plug into, they're going to need a public charger. And public charging is also a big deal when it comes to making car buying decisions. Uh, lots of people have purchased a Tesla uh, because it has a pretty well disputed uh, high power network that requires zero fuss to use, just pull in, plug pull up, plug in, and all of the billing happens automatically. Uh, for non-Tesla owners, the public charger landscape has been trickier. Uh, so to kick things off, Dedrick, uh, can you tell us uh, what are the top things or maybe top several things that, uh, EV, uh, that charging networks have to do to give people the confidence that if they buy an EV, uh, they'll have a convenient way to keep it fueled? And welcome yeah, to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, happy Friday, guys. Um, uh, yeah, Dominic, you said it. Uh, the more, majority of uh, charging uh, occurs at home. Uh, so it's about 80% uh, with some spilling over into uh, workplace. But uh, you're absolutely right. Public charging is essential to ensure uh, driver confidence. Um, you know, people don't, you know, typically don't buy the car for uh, their daily needs. They buy it for that edge case, uh, you know, the, the long road trip uh, uh, for vacations or, um, you know, the trip to grandma's. Uh, so having that public infrastructure network uh, be highly visible and available um, and easy to use is important to uh, instill driver confidence. Um, but I really just want to, you know, touch on like really, you know, there is a uh, really a change in the fueling behavior with an electric vehicle. Um, it, you know, you typically charge where you're spending long periods of time uh, at work. Um, if you're running errands at a retail store, uh, having that opportunity there um, is, you know, it is, it's really, uh, it helps promote, uh, you know, uh, driver confidence. So, um, you know, having lots of dots on the map is, is important. Um, making sure you're filling gaps and, and really making sure those chargers are highly visible. Um, it, it, it goes a long way to in, in instill that driver confidence. That was something I've noticed in talking to some of some several OEMs. That doesn't seem to be a big emphasis on signage around uh, around uh, charging stations. You know, like the branding. I would think that'd be like a huge opportunity, and it doesn't seem like people are are, you know, really focused on that at all. Do you, you do get that at all? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, it's it's a missed opportunity on a lot of sites, again, to bring that, that driver awareness. Um, I think, uh, you know, developers are doing a great job with on-site signage, but as far as uh, wayfinding or highway signage there, you know, there are a lot of uh, areas for improvement. Um, there are some DOTs that now have programs that will uh, you know, install those signs on the highways. Uh, folks are used to seeing the gas station sign and uh, seeing where they could, right. uh, you know, what are the different stops you could you could make off the highway. Um, so there are some states starting to roll out uh, pro uh, programs uh, that guide drivers from the highway to the, the charging site. And it's, it's especially uh, critical in those rural applications. Uh, so along the corridor highways, uh, where, you know, a driver is, you know, they're, they're, you know, they can use an app. Uh, there are some new technologies in car dash, 
uh, navigation systems. Um, you know, ChargePoint just uh, announced uh, we're integrated into Apple CarPlay. Um, so now, you know, those things will get better in time. But for folks that don't have uh, those capabilities in their cars, highway signage is, is really critical. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, it, it, if we could put more emphasis on that signage, it would, you know, further increase uh, driver confidence that, uh, you know, there, there is sufficient infrastructure out there for them to, to charge their vehicles. Right. Like gas stations have those huge signs that, you know, you can see from, you know, half a mile away and like a charging station, there's nothing equivalent to that yet. But anyway, so I'm sure the rest of you all have some questions that you can ask. Maybe uh, Tom, do you want to kick things off? Or, or sure. So maybe Didrik has so some. One of yeah, sorry. I was just going to say uh, we, we just finished a really cool site uh, in Fresno, California with Chevron, uh, that huge sign that you can see from the highway. They actually in incorporated uh, EV charging into that sign. Um, so, you know, obviously it's a, oh, it's a first step, but, um, you know, the fueling industry is starting to buy into this and see the value in, um, you know, promoting uh, EV charging to, to drivers. So uh, positive sign, positive step in the right direction. Right on. Sorry, Tom. No, Sorry. sure. So, You're on. you know, one of the things that I'd like um, Dedrick to talk a little bit about is how ChargePoint has a little bit of a different business model than some of the other large networks in the U.S. And ChargePoint was a, a a very it was very early to this. They 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 had the most uh, charging stations installed in the country. Most of them are level two. They're just now seemingly the last couple of years to begin to to expand DC fast charge, but. What ChargePoint does that's different than, say, Electrify America or EVgo is they sell their equipment to site operators and they then manage the back end of it, the uh, the, the payment systems and, and, uh, and, and control that. But the owner of the property actually is responsible to manage the charging stations. I know this firsthand because I actually own a DC fast charger and a level two charger on the ChargePoint network uh, on a property that I own in Montclair and I manage that. But one of the things we see frequently is people complaining on, on uh, forums and even on Inside EV comments that, oh, you know, ChargePoint stinks. I, I showed up to this, uh, this site and three of the chargers didn't work and, and, and nobody cares about them and the connectors laying on the ground. Um, but they don't realize that ChargePoint has no control over that. They, they sell the equipment to the property owner and it's their job to then keep the equipment functioning and working. Uh, they own it. Um, so Didra, could you talk a little bit about the challenges of um, having that different business model and maybe why that's a better model for ChargePoint to use? Yeah, great. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, so, you know, like you said, uh, we're pretty vertically integrated. We, you know, develop our hardware, develop the software, and then we also provide 24-7 uh, 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 driver support. Um, so, really, we want to enable a host to customize their charger charging service offering uh, for their specific use case. Um, so, ChargePoint's not making money off selling electrons, right? We're we're selling the hardware and then we make, you know, make money on uh, software subscriptions and also uh, extended maintenance and warranties. So uh, we offer a, a package called Assure, which is on the screen right now, uh, guarantees 98% uh, uptime of your charging station. Uh, we send out, we, have, we work with uh, O&M partners across the nation that can come out and service that charger for you. And if a driver has any questions, they call into our, you know, our dedicated customer support team. So we are, you know, kind of the, the foundation for that charging offering. But ultimately, it is the, the, the site host, the charging station owner's decision on which services they subscribe to. Now, we always have our, our you know, our software uh, on the chargers that enables things like uh, remote diagnostics, uh, remote start and stop. There's a you know a bunch of uh, you know great features that you can uh, um, use uh, within the software. Um, but yeah, like like you said, Tom, it's ultimately the 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 charging station owner's decision as to whether they buy that Assure package. Um, you know how they you know maintain the parking spaces, etc. So uh, there's a bit of an education on that. Uh, you know, same thing with pricing. Uh, ChargePoint does not set the price on on the charger. So uh, we try to you know uh, build in some messaging in the app and on the screen. You know, uh, price set by station owner. You know, so we try to make it really clear. But you know, there is uh, some uh, misconception into how we um, you know uh, the ChargePoint business model. Um, 
And, and, and just to just speak to some of the, the merits of that business model, it, it really has allowed us to grow at an exponential rate, uh, you know, much like Airbnb is the largest uh, hotelier uh, industry, industry, but doesn't own any um, uh, char- uh, any hotels. Uh, you know, ChargePoint is the largest network, but we, you know, own very little of our own uh, charging stations. Sure. If, if you don't mind a quick follow up or a uh, question on that. Now, you, you are the largest network, but it's mostly level two charging stations, which I believe you have very robust units, which is why I went in that direction uh, for my own property. Uh, but I think it's also that model is going to hold back your expansion of DC fast because um, unlike, say, we mentioned Electrify America or EVgo, they go into a site and they'll install four or five DC fast chargers and it might cost three or four hundred thousand dollars to do so. Uh, you know you, it's, it's going to be harder to find individuals, property owners, property managers that are willing to put out that kind of money when for the foreseeable future, they'll never make their money back. you know it's, it's, it's a losing uh, proposition uh, installing you know a, a four hundred thousand dollar, let's say, uh, DC fast charge site because it'll take many years to get to recoup your money if ever. Um, so I think that might hold back DC fast charge expansion on the uh, on the charge point network. It's why most of your network I think is level two now. Um, is there is there any um, is there anything on the horizon? Maybe some kind of partnerships that we might be looking forward to to see where where you can get some of your ultra high powered say the express units which are really good dc fast charge units we just don't have too many of them out there because it's hard to find site owners to invest that kind of money into that um is there any maybe chance on the horizon that that we might see a different business model so that you can get more of these out there yeah, uh, so, uh, you know, good points. Uh, DC fast charging is a little, uh, you know, it's more expensive than level two. And, uh, you know, like you said, Tom, um, there are con- concerns about the operating costs and things like that. But I will say the, the port growth is happening. Um, you know, we uh, released our first DC fast charging product, uh, you know, built in house uh, last year sometime. And I think, you know, we're over a thousand units already. Um, and, you know, you touched on it. It is those partnerships, um, you know, so we've been working on, you know, the urban core, uh, those, those networks are getting built out. There's, a, you know, there's uh, good use cases there. There's fleet vehicles, uh, uh, transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft announcing, um, you know, plans to go electric. Uh, so there, you know, there are opportunities in the urban core. Um, but once you get away from there, that's when you start to run into some of those uh, larger challenges. Um, and what I've seen is is those partnerships come into play pretty significantly, um, and it it varies by location. Uh, so you you know you might have municipal utilities or co-ops uh, chipping in, uh, the local municipality, uh, universities. Uh, just to give an example, um, you know we're working with Tennessee Tech University um, in the upper Cun- Upper Cumberland region of Tennessee, where the university is getting involved. The utility is getting involved. They're leveraging grant funds. Um, you know, they've partnered with, uh, you know, uh, transportation network companies, OEMs, uh, bringing all these different groups together to provide their own value and, um, you know, make that uh, those charging sites happen. So um, I don't know that there's a silver bullet across the board. It really does matter on a site by site basis, utility by utility basis. Uh, and then also, you know, what kind of incentives are there? You know, we still have the federal tax credit, uh, the Volkswagen settlements, dis- uh, dispensing money across the nation, uh, the Biden, uh, you know, the Biden team, um, you know, talking about significant investments in infrastructure. So I think we're going to continue to see, uh, you know, kind of these partnerships play a critical role um, at the at the local level, um, and and the network will continue to build itself that way. Cool, hey, Kyle. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I I'm I'm very curious about this. Uh, ChargePoint sells the units, obviously, to who's installing them. Do you guys provide any? Uh, insight or uh, recommendation as to charging power specifically for DC charging, but also for level two. Most of the level twos are are 30 amp at, at you know business voltage, 208. It's just like what, six kilowatts or so, which is pretty low, especially as you can just, you know, plug in a 60 amp breaker and pull 48 amps 
so is there a push for higher power AC charging and then the recommendation to utilities or, or private businesses installing DC chargers to do more than just that 50 kilowatt? Because on the CPE 250s, I've used them on a couple road trips now, never had an issue once activating them, super reliable, nice and quiet. Uh, but some of them are only 50 kilowatts and I'm like, this thing can do 125 or more. So where does ChargePoint come in to at least say, look, you know, we have bigger battery, new EVs. We have Kyle out there road tripping everywhere. Just joking. But we need, you know, we need to up the power levels a little bit. Here. Yeah. So what, what um, can you guys do to help rolled that? out uh, flexible power in our home unit. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the amperage is slipping my mind right now, but it's basically a flexible uh, amperage that you can you can set at the time of installation. So, you know, higher power level to charging. Um, uh, and uh, there might be some other things on the horizon that I, I can't talk about in the level two space. But uh, in the in the DC space, uh, we do have you know the the CPE two hundred and fifty, which as a standalone unit is a sixty two point five kW uh, charger. But when installed in pairs, they can share share that power, so up to one hundred twenty five uh, kilowatts, as you explained. And then on our website, there's also um, you know our Express Plus line. Um, which will be re re released in the in, in the in the somewhat near future. Um, there you go, up to 500 kilowatts of of energy. So we're we're definitely uh, focused on you know higher power, but higher power isn't everything. I know everyone wants higher power, but if you really look at the uh, the the charging profiles of today's EVs, like the infrastructure that's out there today, is really suitable for the bulk. Of, of of the of the vehicles on the road so um yeah I well that i totally agree with with the cars today you know you we still have a lot of leafs on the road we yeah. still have i3s um but uh these this infrastructure lasts for 10 15 20 years uh so so my only thing is i'd love to see uh, higher power chargers, especially as we see Tycon, for example, hold 270 kilowatt to 50%. You don't want to be a Tycon owner sitting at 62 and a half kilowatt or even some of these CPU 250s. I've seen multiple uh, limited to 50 kilowatt. Um, and just up here in, in Colorado, for example, we have a 50 kilowatt unit, which is uh, I'm not sure why they would limit it because there's four stations. You think you'd have the power. But, you know, there's so many uh, opportunities to drive what the manufacturers will put in the cars. It's sort of the chicken before the egg thing, where if you have the infrastructure to support 300, 400, 500 kilowatt chargers, then the manufacturers may go and actually make those cars. But if there's no infrastructure, there's no reason for them to design them. This is how I've always viewed it. Have you uh, found this in your uh, partnerships with uh, electric automakers that, you know, they're they're really waiting for the network to catch up before they increase the car uh, charging capacity? Yeah, uh, so, or is it the so, other so way around? So, so I just want to circle back to, you know, Tom's comment about the, the cost of, you know, owning and operating a DC fast charger. Um, you know, you really don't want to overspend today because the operation can be a bit challenging. So what we suggest to hosts that are installing DC fast charging, like upon the initial installation, uh, prepare your site for future expansion and growth. So that means running the right size conduit so you can upsize that down the road, uh, pouring your transformer pad uh, uh, so that it's large enough to accommodate a future transformer. And what we do, you know, what that does is, is it enables your site uh, to expand uh, cost effectively when utilization uh, demands that. So that could either be more power, more chargers, uh, uh, you name it. Um, but, you know, preparing that site the proper way up front with the right conduit, the right, you know, the right pads, et cetera, uh, will really save you some money in the long run. So. You know, if I was talking to a host, I wouldn't come in and say, hey, overbuild your system now. I would say right size it for today. Uh, take a look at the data over time. And then, you know, we can help you assess the right time to add more charters or add more power. Right on. Can I um, can I. Can I ask? Maybe it's not a charge point specific question, but just uh, you, so with deep knowledge of the the EV world, as we get into that next phase of the adoption curve of you know uh, the, the the people who care about kilowatt hours and voltages of packs uh, diminish, and yeah. just people 
end up renewing their lease and happen to get you know an, an electric car what can we do to make everyone who is a non-tesla owner because i do want to recognize as a, i don't own a tesla but the supercharging network is so frictionless and so easy to use and it is just hey you bought a tesla it's like owning an apple phone give us your credit card you'll buy something from the you know the app store and we'll bill you chuck you know, plug in and tesla will bill you what can we do for the vast majority of people who aren't going to buy those premium cars you know what's your opinion on making that process as like slick and simple we've seen apple carplay integrating charge point here in the uk now um, that really helps but you know in your opinion yeah yeah so i'd say uh, over the last people? few years we've been you know working on that problem with uh the other uh you know other networks in the industry uh and it's through roaming agreements so it's it's a peer-to-peer -peer agreements with other networks that makes the the charging experience seamless for the driver no matter what network they work on. So we've executed, uh, you know, at least five of such roaming agreements, uh, you know, in, in the U.S. Um, so what that does is it, it, it really makes a frictionless, um, uh, a frictionless uh, charging experience for the driver, no matter what, you know, network they belong to or what RFID card or app they use. Um, you know, they can just come up and, and, and use, you know, their, their normal card and then uh, on any, you know, any network and, you know, be able to, you know, charge their char charge their cars uh, pretty, pretty easily. Um, also, you know, other payment options such as, uh, you know, contactless payments like uh, Apple Pay, uh, Android Pay, um, you know, that uh, functions like that really make make things, uh, you know, easy for for the masses. Yeah. And just a, a follow up question on that, again, might not be charge point specific, but just your opinion, uh, you know, as an expert, how do you see that 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 sort of charging, uh, not charging of plugging in, but the the billing process just becoming as easy as possible? So I've got a, a key fob from my electricity provider. They're quite uh, forward thinking. And my electricity company's done some uh, some deals with not many, but a few networks here in the UK. So that if I go to those charging stations, I can wave the key fob from my home electric account. And then it just goes on to my home bill. So at the end of the month, I pay for my home heating and my cooking and oh, and my driving as well. And that works really well for me just to think of my my energy usage. And so my bill, my mobility tends to get folded into my energy usage. No longer am I thinking of, well, that's my home and that's the gas station. Um, how can we make the billing process for people as, as simple as possible? Of course, I know plug and charge comes into that and ISO 15118 uh, or whatever it, it's called. But how, you know, if we were to paint a, a dream ticket here, how good can things get in terms of making like yeah, these? No, unfortunately, I'm not a, uh, you know, a product uh, manager, but I think that the foundation is there with the roaming uh, agreements, uh, you know, all that uh, billing transactions is happening in the background, unbeknownst to the customer with no additional fees or, or, or you know, uh, any, any other you know, things to worry about. Um, so uh, while I can't, you know, completely comment on, you know, what, you know, products might be developed in the future, it seems like we have a good um, system in place now that can be leveraged uh, for additional efficiencies in the future. Okay, and if I can, just, just one one final question. Like, we're, we're often, because we have an expert on the line here, like we're often told, like, fast chargers are great. And I kind of have this obsession with, well, that's great, but what about if I went to a car park um, and it had, you know, 2000 spaces and each of those had like a really low powered plug. I've seen pictures of them in China and, and, and things. And I kind of wonder, I like, we need someone to do it. Like what's, you know, so what's your opinion on that balance of, because the fast charge is really sexy and we love to, you know, if you do own an, a, a great car, right. Um, yeah. it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's great to talk about them. I own a Renault Zoe that charges at 22 kilowatts max, and it's only on AC anyway. Um, and, you know, we're lucky we've got a lot of a, a AC posts around here. But I'm kind of interested in the idea of, but yeah, but what if I went somewhere or paid for public parking when I went to the office and my car was going to be stationary for eight hours, 10 hours? You know, what if there was like 2,000 just domestic plugs? Does that work for EV drivers? Yeah, I mean, um I think you lose some of the functionality uh, from a from a site owner perspective, and um, you know some of the uh, control that you have over your the energy on site. So uh, while I think it's you know it's feasible, there there are you know numerous manufacturers and numerous software <laughs> offerings that have that power limiting capability that you're talking about through software. Um, so 
you know, it's not a, it's not a one size fits all. You want to have that modularity and the ability to, uh, you know, change the power levels, um, you know, depending on the use case, because, you know, while it may be a, a long-term lot today, you know, who knows, you might, uh, you know, charge in some fleet vehicles there and want to be able to charge them at a higher rate. So I think today's, uh, you know, today's hardware and software uh, really enables that and, and can be deployed at scale. Um, and, you know, you might be thinking, well, you know, there might be some limitations on the grid. Well, you know, through various software capabilities, you're able to overload panels, overload circuits, and still, you know, provide that, that same consistent experience that you would have at any public charter. Right on. Hey, so we're, we're kind of short on time, but I have a few questions from Twitter and Facebook. If, if I could just list them off and maybe hit them real quick. What do you think, Dedrick? Great. Yep. All right on. Okay. This is cool. So, I like it. Uh, yeah, we put, so we put out some questions on social media and uh, got a bunch here. So we'll just try to run through some real quick. So, and you've kind of answered some of these, you know, so don't feel like you need to spend a lot of time on them. Uh, so Mike Ernest asks, uh, can they put chargers at gas stations? Absolutely. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of interest from gas stations for DC fast charging. They're in the fueling business and there are more and more vehicles right. coming on the road, uh, more commitments from OEMs. So, uh, yeah, the, the the fueling and convenience industry are uh, you know really waking up to this opportunity. We're we're doing a lot of work with those those industries. Right. Hey, are you, what's that? There's a new like a uh, network of store. Actually, Martin, you probably know about this. this. Is like Gridpoint or something? They have a bunch of different stores with like multi vehicle charging and like a. Uh, store yeah, over with, here it's um, they, it opens up in a couple of days um right. it should have been november but it, i think it, it got covid did um but they um uh, they're called grid serve and their you know their philosophy is um big charging stations like filling stations um with solar canopies a tesla supercharging bank as well plus um, their own you know their, their own hardware uh, a range of charging speeds plus a coffee shop a gym um uh, somewhere to eat, uh, get takeaway food. Uh, first one should be opening uh, in um, a county called Essex in the next few days here. Of course, massively capital intensive, um, but they have, you know, right. they have some backers that see that as a business model. Um, and again, you know, I think, you know, one is great, but we, you know, we need many more. And just the investment right. well, is, you know, eye watering and I wouldn't want to be writing those checks. But what they've done is amazing for the first one. Well, I understand they have, they have like a hundred of those coming. Yeah, so, that's that's you know that's certainly the promise. Um, but um, but yeah, okay. it's just hugely hugely expensive to build one, let alone the hundreds. And and then that the ROI on it. I see if I can find a picture while we're talking. Uh, you know, the ROI on it is uh, is certainly a challenge in the short term. But I think if you know if you're playing the long term sure. game uh, on this, then you know perhaps you know you're in a good position either for you know to generate some oh, here we go either generate some revenue on that um or um you know or an exit or an acquisition because you'll be in a really good position you know, there's plenty of big energy companies that would want that kind of thing in their portfolio so it's a it's a smart business and they're doing really cool things that's it, under construction obviously right so this this is kind of like the sort of the model that i could see uh uh get like at the gas station companies uh whatever or oil companies exxon etc um investing in you know if they if they really decide or understand that this is like the, fu the future and if they want to be in the future in, in the business of distributing energy this is kind of like a model they should be looking at and yeah, anyway and that's, also you know reliability as well so that as an ev driver there's nothing worse than knowing that you're going somewhere with a you know a low state of charge and there's one there's one charger like you know but then there's right. when there's 30 you're like okay well I can afford to be uh, out one and that's one of the, the things actually there's a network over here called uh, Instavolt and they've got a really good reputation because they use charge point hardware which is all quite new and actually um it's it's that hardware that if you turn up to it's it's just always going to work at the moment that's a benefit of being new but it's it's you know also testament to the hardware um that that you know that it's actually it, it's only it's not ac but actually you know what it's probably if i get there it's going to if it's not busy it's going to at least it's going to work we've got some legacy hardware here um from early investors 
and you know you've got to keep spending money on updating that hardware because now you turn up to it and it you know it kind of works doesn't work and that's a real frustration okay uh, so let's move on to the next question real quick. Um, Alexander Daniels asks, how do they monitor their charging locations for necessary maintenance? Uh, and in a similar and in a similar vein, MD Volt asks, is there any new tech providing station operators the ability to detect station problems, failures, and initiate servicing immediately without human intervention, meaning that days don't go by until a stranded motorist reports a problem? Dedrick? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'll speak to ChargePoint, uh, remote diagnostics uh, and, you know, remote right. start and stop capabilities are core to our software offering. So, uh, yes, you're able to, you know, see how your, your charges are performing from, you know, a mechanical perspective, but also like a network perspective, uh, especially when you start to get into some rural uh, uh, communities. It's, it's really, you know, can be challenging to get uh, the proper sales signals out there. So all those capabilities are built into uh, our, our software. Uh, as far as, um, you know, no uh, human intervention, um, I don't know if the industry's uh, quite there yet, but I could, you know, see it, it head in that direction. But uh, as, of, as of today, you know, for, I could speak for ChargePoint, uh, we have that full dedicated um, uh, support service that's there 24-7 for drivers, as well as every business day for charging station owners. Sweet. Uh, the Green Texan asks, uh, "Are all of their stations are no? Are all of their stations going to become part of the plug and charge movement, like Electrify America?" Um, again, yeah, I'm not a product development person. So I'll, I'll have to defer ah, on that question. Okay. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, okay, I'm not sure what this name about this name. Alkalite Brome uh, asks. When will our destination infrastructure flesh out? Museums, concert halls, ballparks, beaches, ski slopes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, places we might drive two, 300 miles round trip in a day, add 100 miles while at an event rather than on the way home. So yeah, asking about, so when people go out in their general, you know, going to commute, going to work, coming back, you have an idea how many miles you're gonna use, but the, he's asking, I guess about, you know, a charging at destination, um, because yeah, I'd say that, that, work is, that work is being done there. You know, we're uh, deploying in more, uh, you know, corridor locations across the U S and, um, you know, yeah, I, I just say it's, it's happening, uh, piece by piece. There are, you know, other models out there that are, you know, specifically target these types of, uh, locations. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's coming. What say. Okay. Uh, let's just go with one more quick one. Uh, Alex Gombert asks, how are they working to streamline the install process at apartment complexes? Yeah, so, um, yeah, apartments can be challenging, especially some of your older apartments with, uh, you know, kind of older uh, grids. Uh, so uh, we, we provide, you know, full training for installation, um, but to the apartment um, uh, application specifically, we've developed, uh, you know, functionalities in our software that allow us to oversubscribe circuits and panels. Um, that's what really uh, hampers development in multifamily uh, properties. So um, now being able to put more plugs on that same circuit and serve more residents, um, that's what's really opening that up. And then, you know, back to the DC side, we're now beginning to see uh, pilots and deployments uh, within multifamily clusters of DC fast chargers so that uh, the drivers in the surrounding community can now come in charge at that hub, uh, you know, just because, you know, some of these buildings are just really old and a bit cost prohibitive to upgrade those, those um, panels and such. Um, but yeah, as far as like uh, installation support, uh, how to do it, you know, we have national partners that that are well uh, versed in our in, the, in our product. And even if you're not an OM partner, you can go to our website and get training on how to install our charters. Right on. Well, I, I want to follow up with a quick comment, Tom, uh, sure. about the service. I think MD Volt uh, had the uh, tweet about, uh, um, you know, uh, remote service. One thing I will sell, give ChargePoint credit for is 
whenever there's a complaint about my site, uh, whenever there's a service issue, I get a phone call. So if somebody shows up and can't plug in uh, and they report it to ChargePoint, I immediately get a phone call from support saying, hey, somebody was at your station and they couldn't um, they couldn't get it to work. So they are ChargePoint is on top of things as far as notifying the property owners when there's some sort of an issue um, detected with the equipment. Now, then it's then on the property owners, uh, you know, plate to actually fix it or address the issue or even take a look at it, you know. And uh, the, the, the funny thing is sometimes um, I'll get notified that somebody can't, somebody attempted to, to use my DC fast charger, which is a CCS DC fast charger. Um, and then I'll find out later it was a Tesla owner and, and, and they, they couldn't, they, they, they couldn't figure out how to get it to work. Well, because it won't work. You know, you, there, there isn't uh, actually, there wasn't, there's was actually a, a CCS to Tesla connector that's been developed oh. now um and uh, mm. i'm supposed to be getting an early copy of it to test it out soon uh, for the u.s market there was a european C tesla ccs connect uh, adapter that's been floating around for a year or so now but but we didn't have one for ccs one type one here in the u.s but evidently a company in china has developed it and we should be testing it out soon so i th I, I just wanted to give charge point a little credit there they, they have very good customer service. Whenever there's an issue detected on my site, I get a phone call from them saying, hey, go check yeah. this out. So uh, I'd like to thank you, Dedrick, for coming in and spending some time with us today. Um, I, I guess we probably could have done a whole show on this like easily. <laughs> Man, time kind of went by. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I guess uh, any, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, want to tell us how to, how to do that? Yeah, uh, you can reach out to me at grants at chargepoint.com. Easiest way to get in contact with me, grants at chargepoint.com. Right on. Great. All right. So uh, we'll, we'll probably talk to you afterwards. Have great. a great Thanks. weekend. Thanks, so Thanks for having me, guys. All right. All right. Well, he's gone. Okay. So, uh, man, there's still a bunch of stuff to talk about today. Um, so let's go from charging to uh, winter tires. Uh, if you live where it gets below freezing, you should have winter tires. Uh, even if there's like no snow, snow to deal with, uh, that's because the rubber in summer tires and to some extent all seasons is not really formulated to deal with cold weather. And they become hard and they lose traction, stopping abilities, making your car less capable than in warmer months. Uh, I understand, Kyle, that you've put some new rubber on a couple of EVs, and I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about those and maybe how hard it is to find low rolling resistance uh, winter tires. Yeah, so for a series that I'm doing on the Out of Spec Reviews channel, I wanted to do some tire testing, at least you know, dip our toes into it, see if people were interested. And man, have we gotten so many emails and questions about this, uh, but we won't go all into it in this episode. Right. I think we'll do a roundup at the end of the winter, but uh, two different vehicles, two different tires. So the first, uh, we own a BMW i3, of course, and the i3 has these little tiny like 155 section tires in the front, 175s in the rear. It's a staggered from the factory. Uh, and good luck trying to find a selection of tires available in that size. It's pretty much one or two tires. And um, I actually reached out to Bridgestone. I was like, how hard was it to make these tires? And uh, we're going to be doing a whole video with one of their engineers that's recorded on uh, out of spec reviews. So make sure oh, you cool. check that out. But basically we got um, the, the Bridgestone LM 500 uh, winter tires, which are Blizzax. And these things were pretty cool. Now the I three, um, uh, uh, BMW, I should say, recommends that you go with a square setup. So we went with 155 section tires. That's the width in millimeters on all four corners. So uh, in the snow, which is crazy to think about, these little pizza cutters actually worked out pretty well. We took the car up into the mountains the other day and found some steep hills and just floored it straight up the hills and it crawled its way up. Uh, whereas the other uh, set, the original set, uh, which were also Bridgestone tires, uh, basically got stuck in the driveway. So I was very impressed with that. And, um, you know, that's that's the i3. And then the Tesla, we are doing a series called like the ultimate winter tire setup. We just did our first video uh, on out of spec motoring for that car, but the rest will be on reviews. And this car has the 18 inch Martian wheels 
on the car. And then I went with the Nokian Hakapalita R3s, which I just think sound really cool. So it makes it sound awesome. Right. They're finished tires. And, uh, you know, supposedly from all of the testing and stuff, these are just the winter tire to go for. They're not really that known in the U.S., but in, like, the Nordic countries, everyone runs these. So I went with the most aggressive tire that's not studded because, again, still a lot of my driving is going to be on dry pavement. But as soon as we head up into the mountains, it's going to be on deep snow, ice. So, Martin, if you play that video through, you can see us rallying it through some of the beautiful roads here in Colorado. We have awesome trails that we can shred right around and um yeah i gotta tell you these things were crazy impressive in the snow the braking performance especially was just like are we on pavement or are we on snow and ice it really was impressive so um that's great a lot of people have been asking us to compare to all season and all weather tires these will all come in due time Right on. And Nokia is an interesting company because they also make summer tires and because, but they're known for the winter tires. So because they're not really known for the summer tires, you can get good deals in the U S on their summer tires. And I actually have Nokians on, on a vehicle of mine and I actually really like them. But yeah. They're super, yeah, Florida, super high quality. I don't really need to worry about. Yeah. I'm in Florida. I don't really need to worry about snow, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We need to do some, some good tire, show sometime because it's a, a big deal uh, all right I so let's hit some news Sorry. i just picked up a set of um uh winter tires for my model three and uh, uh okay. i got a fantastic deal i got them from somebody who had a uh a model three and had to sell it and he bought the winter tires and never even put them on and uh lo somebody local so i got the whole set for for 200 bucks and they're brand new. So nice. it's like what it costs wow. for one tire, I scored. And uh, so I'm going to be putting those on when I get my new Model 3. I'm supposed to get it next Wednesday. Um, so less than a week, I'll have the car. Uh, I'm immediately taking it to get wrapped. So it's going to take another three or four days. But the following week, I'll have the winter tires on it. And uh, looking forward to, um, you know, get it, getting it out once it snows here and doing a review on those also. That'll be sweet. What, what uh, kind of tires are they? The Michelin's. I think they're X ice. Uh, I forget the exact. Um, yep, the exact X ice. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, probably yeah. the threes. They have different ones, but yeah, the X ice three is probably what those are. Yeah, I, I didn't even fully vet the the the, the 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 exact tire because when he said, "Yeah, just give me two hundred bucks for the set," I was like, "Yeah, like I don't care what it is. Yeah. They're brand new winter right. tires for what it costs to buy one. I think they're like one eighty each. So uh, you know, I." I scored. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's let's get some news. There's not, there's not a ton of news, but there's some good good news this week. So uh, uh, Ford has revealed it has a Mustang Mach E GT Performance Edition. We already knew it had they had a GT, but this other variant is even hotter. It's got the same 480 horsepower as a GT, but it's got 34 more torques. So up to the 340, uh, 300. Uh, sorry. 634 foot pound feet of torque. Uh, that's a bit of difference. Uh, that bit of difference is enough to lower the zero to 60 time by about half a second. The GT does it in just under four seconds, they say. And the GT Performance Edition does it in 3.5 seconds. Uh, Kyle, what more can you tell us about the spicy pumpkin? I, I call it a pumpkin because in the photos, I, yeah, I like that the, the spicy here. pumpkin. Well, I would say spicy is absolutely the word for this thing. I mean, look, you're on on par zero to sixty with Model Y, and if we know anything about Ford up to this right. point, I think it's going to be faster than that, and I think they will beat the current Model Y claims. Now, will Tesla go out and just turn up the dial to eleven? Sure, probably, but pretty cool that we kind of right. have this battle. Uh, you know, the the yeah. only downside for going with the spicy pumpkin is the the range loss and it's probably due to the wheel and tire combination they're putting sticky rubber larger wheels it's 234 miles epa uh, we'll have to see what that equates to in real world um, we might see a, a big gap on paper from 270 to 234 but in real life it may actually be closer uh, these are just the oddities of EPA testing cycle, but we know we're going to get massive brakes, good suspension, racing seats, and it's going to be track capable. So you'll be seeing me shredding one of these things around a racetrack uh, sometime middle of next year, whenever they roll out. And I cannot wait to um, give Ford back their car with no tires left. 
So the, the regular GT it gets uh, it gets two hundred. I think it gets two hundred fifty miles. All right, range the regular GT. Regular GT. I don't know offhand, but I know this one's. I believe two three four, uh, two hundred thirty four miles of EPA rated range. Yeah, I have two thirty five here, but yeah, that's oh yeah, it might be for sure. Forgive me for being off by a little bit. Yeah, right in that no, region. No, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Tom, what do you think of this thing? I think it looks awesome. And that, that cyber orange metallic looks fantastic. Yeah, That's, right? you know, I, I had loved the blue um, GT look, but one, once I got one look at this, I was like, hmm, is it too late to cancel my Model 3 order now? <laughs> uh, of course, and this would be significantly more. So uh, it's probably just stretched out of my budget a little bit. And plus, I'd have to wait a while for it. But uh, I think it looks fantastic. And I, I fully expected Ford to do this. I really did. You know, Ford, ha we've talked about this before in the podcast. I just love what they're doing with the Mach-E. They just keep making it better. They, 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 It seems like every month or two, we get new news that's better news, that's more interesting news. You know, th that Ford did a fantastic rollout, starting from the introduction um, out at the uh, LA Auto Show where they, you know, really put the whole brand on the line and had Bill Ford out there. And, you know, they invited tons of people and had the whole lineup of Mustangs all lined up next to this. You know, um, this is what you want to see uh, from, from you know, automakers and, uh, you know, kind of like not what we see from GM, which is a little disappointing. But, you know, I, I love this, this new performance edition. And uh, I love just everything what Ford's been doing since we first, learned about the Mach-E. They, they've really treated this great, and ca I can't wait to, to, to get behind the wheel of, of, the, of these vehicles. I, uh, you know, I, I may own one in the future, we'll see, but I, I, it's absolutely, the, not just the vehicle, what, uh, what makes me really happy is how Ford is really doing this rollout. Everything seems to be just, you know, how you want to see an EV introduced. Ford's taken this serious, and uh, that's good to see. Very few other legacy o OEMs seem to be taking it serious. Volkswagen is, um, you know, they've got their whole brand behind the ID4. That's going to be their, you know, their, their next, you know, million uh, car that sells millions per year. But very few other manufacturers, they're all kind of just saying, oh, yeah, we love EVs. We're going to be all EV by 2030. But like, you know, then they dip their toe in it. So, um, but Ford, uh, with this with this vehicle here, they're all in, and that's good to see. Right on. It also has the uh, comes with a Ford Performance seat, I guess. And do you know, Kyle, if the GT comes with that, or if it's just the GT Performance Edition? I think it's just the Performance Edition. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking to it. And this one also comes it with twenty be, inch wheels. It could be one where the GT gets a more aggressive seat, and then the Performance gets another level of aggressive seat. Uh, you know, these big right. OEMs have no problem going to make 14 seat designs and 9,000 grills for their, their vehicles. They have the capacity to do so. So we'll have to wait and see to test each each configuration, of course. Right. Yeah, I, I believe, and these seats are coming from Ford Performance, which is like the like the performance arm. They also make stuff for, you know, uh, whatever in competition vehicles anyway. Yeah, sure. And, and Tom, talking about the grill, that seems to be like the nicest adaptation of the Mach E grill on this performance right. edition. Uh, maybe I don't know if it's the the, the color, the how it bounces, but it, it just it looks great in some um, configurations and some colors on the Mach E. The grill just it 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 doesn't work for me, but that works. I think that right. looks awesome. It looks aggressive, uh, and it and it really looks cool. I don't know if it's the colors right, yeah, that's the thing. different with it, but um, mm. that just pops. Right. The, the non-GT versions have. Yeah. For me, what it is, I don't know if I can find a, a, a picture of it. It's the, it's the, it's the kind of outline of the grill. See like that in the blue, I'm not sure about it's that sort of weird black and in photos, it never looks right. And, and also, in person, it looks way better. So there's something weird about the styling of the car. It depends on color, but yeah, you're absolutely, absolutely right that 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 special edition, because it's got that solid black, almost carbon fibery effect, just looks like that. 
make all right. the cars look like yeah, that. I wasn't a big fan of when I saw like the body color on the on the front piece there. It's, mm, it's, I mean, it's grown on me a little bit more now. I, I, re- I appreciate it more now, but no, it looks I, I really do like the way this thing looks, especially with the black trim. Yeah. This is such okay. an interesting conversation because we get half of our comments are stop putting nose cones and grills on non EVs. And then half of our <laughs> comments are, well, we, we like the grill and the Mustang and I'm pretty sure it's the same people. So, <laughs> you know, we'll have to battle this one out on, on Twitter, I think, but uh, yeah, no, right. I, I, if I was to get one, I actually think I like the orange more than the blue. They, you know, I think uh, they'll have other colors too, but why would you even consider it? You should just get this or the blue if you're getting the hot one. I kind of like the white, but anyway, um, so this comes standard 20 inch wheels and 19 inch brakes instead of 18 inch brakes. I'm like, I don't know how, how you put a 19 inch brake on that. Yeah, I was yeah. looking at that. Like that's gotta be a typo. I, I don't know. You, you have a one inch for a caliper. There's no way. I think it probably has 15 inch rotors and maybe they're measuring the entire braking system from the edge of the caliper to the, which I've never seen done before, but there's no way it has 19 inch rotors with 20 inch wheels. I just don't know. And maybe there's magic in there, but I don't see that happening. Right. Yeah. I was, I was assuming that's like the, the pad or whatever, or the, the whole assembly around the pad. Right, caliper. Uh, anyway, let's uh, move on to the next thing. I mean, our time is crazy today. Um, so this is the most boring headline ever, but it's a really a pretty big deal. Hyundai introduces us to its eGMP platform. eGMP. <laughs> so basically, they've <laughs> basically they've uh, just shown off the flexible skateboard that uh, future EVs for the Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis brands will sit on. Basically, they're following the example set by Volkswagen with its MEB platform, and to some extent, GM. The idea is to engineer a, a skateboard that uh, many hundreds of thousands of vehicles will eventually share. So there's like a commonality of parts here, uh, which is a lot cheaper than building a platform for an SUV and then a platform for a midsize at sedan, et cetera. So uh, this new platform uh, will have it, the vehicles on it will have ranges of over 500 kilometers that's 311 miles on a single charge under the wltp cycle uh zero to 60 could be as quick as 3.5 seconds so right up there with the mach e uh, gt performance edition uh eventually uh, and let's see 80 a top speed of uh, 260 kilometers an hour. This is 162 miles an hour, which is you know plenty fast. Uh, 80% recharge should be possible in 18 minutes at 350 kilowatts or at that's 800 volts. So that's that's a pretty big deal. That's a good number. Uh, bidirectional charging. So they call it charge to load. We call it. Some people call it charge to vehicle to uh, vehicle to grid, but. Yeah. Uh, also a five links suspension, which is really cool. Hopefully Kyle will tell us a bit about that and uh, rear motor with optional front motors and disconnect technology. And finally, it's got uh, SIC silicone carbide components in the inverter for improved efficiency. So yeah, it's all some really good notes there. Tom, any, uh, any comments about this right off the top? Well, you know, we expect all the manufacturers to eventually go to some sort of a, a skateboard design like this, you know, follow Tesla's lead, Volkswagen came out with them. So, you know, that's not a surprise that that the Hyundai group is doing this. Um, what I like to see about this is two things. Number one, that they're exploring or they're going to be using 800 volt battery packs as well as 400 volt battery packs. So they're going yeah. in that direction also with the 800 volts. I think that was a big thing. And also the bi-directional charging that you talked about. I think those are the two things that I really took from this as being, okay, that's great. You know, that they, they get it. They're, 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 you know, exploring, they're looking down the road of things we're going to be doing. Now we'll never get to vehicle to grid if manufacturers don't start making cars that are capable of it. And, you know, I know they're saying, well, you know, there's no, there, there's, there's not a lot of use of it yet because there's work that has to be done outside of the automotive industry in order to us to really be able to take advantage to, to, to vehicle to home or vehicle to grid. Uh, but somebody has to start first. You know, it's kind of like what Kyle was talking about before about the um, the DC fast charge. Do we build chargers that are faster or do we build cars 
that can accept the power first. And if, if both sides wait for the other side, it never gets done. So it's good to see that uh, manufacturers are saying, hey, this is going to be um, something that we use down the road. So we're going to start building it out now. And, uh, you know, those are the two big things that, that I took from this. Of course, you know, 100 kilometers uh, of recharge in five minutes. That's a great uh, thing to be wow. able to promote. Um, a lot of people don't want to sit around even for 18 minutes to get to 80%. And you only need to do that if you're on a long road trip. But if you're if you're super low and you just need to finish your day running errands and, uh, you know, that five minute stop for 100 kilometers or 60 or so miles, that that that's going to resonate with people that, hey, you only have to stop for five minutes and you'll get, you know, more than your daily uh uh, driving needs for most people. So uh, those are the things that I took from this that that are big. Um, and uh, you know, the the vehicle to grid stuff is 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 going to be huge, and it's good to see that Hyundai's uh, picking this up now. Kyle, what do you like about this? What do you, what do, do you have a favorite vehicle that you think that's going to be uh, have this underneath of it? Well, that's what I want to talk about, actually. Uh, Something about this strategy has me a little worried. Now, granted, I'm a huge fan of this strategy going with one basically skateboard platform then adapting it to your entire model range. But I have to say, we haven't really seen this really in practice. It's going to be so difficult to tune and engineer the character of your different models off of one skateboard. Now, certainly there's things that you can do to make it drive differently here or there. But I think, you know, one of the benefits we've had in the past as a car enthusiast is I know that, you know, if you have a bespoke chassis for the car, it's built from the ground up to serve that purpose. And it's 100 percent optimized versus having, uh, you know, one platform and adapting it many ways. It from a cost perspective and a scalability perspective, I get all the benefits. It's just from a brand driving identity from a model range. And I think we can look at uh, Volvo Group for the closest this. They have something called the SPA, SPA, Scalable Product Architecture. They also have CMA, which is the Compact uh, Modular Architecture. And you can drive a Polestar 1. And then a Volvo V90, which is their big station wagon to their sports car, they literally drive identically. I mean, very few differences. Uh, and it's all just sure. suspension tuning. But uh, I worry that, um, you know, once we start seeing this cross sharing of, of uh, platforms, especially from Volkswagen to Ford with the MEB platform, for example, they may all have the same character. And it'll kind of just be like, Here's the car. They all drive the same. What do you want it to look like? And that's fine for 99% of people. But for the car enthusiasts, I still have to feel like I represent them a little bit. Uh, there's just going to be a little bit less of a driving identity to the different models. Now, this is a really good idea. Obviously, they're not going to design cars for the less than 1% over here. So uh, I'm, I'm all on board with the eGump uh, platform and uh, all looks really good. Love the 800 volt stuff. Everyone should just be doing this now. Um, and uh, yeah. all for it. Right on. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what advantage the five link suspension is going to bring to it? Also, the, uh, and just to address your former point, um, so they can have different length wheelbases, the different vehicles, and they'll have different weights of vehicle on top of that. So that will change the, the road feel somewhat. I don't know if it's enough to really make a difference for you, though. Yeah, well, when you have a multi-link uh, suspension set up, you know, you just have more adjustability and control of where that wheel and tire is going to go. Uh, and this is a way for them to tune in some of the character from their sporty versions to their higher ones. It, it's really hard to say uh, I've driven multi-link suspension setups that are complete crap and I've driven some that are really good. So it's going to be okay. all about how they tune and engineer it. The benefits are uh, first off, it should give you a little bit more of that solid ride quality feeling. It's going to you know, give you a lot of control over the car. Uh, we've seen multi-link setups for a long time. It's nothing new, but typically right. in uh, higher end vehicles, of course. And uh, we'll see how it plays through. I, I hope they give this thing a really good, good drive. I uh, am excited to see what goes on top of it. I'm looking forward to that Hyundai Prophecy. I think it's one of my favorites coming up. Okay, Martin, anything you want to say about this before we move on? 
Yeah, I would just separate out the the specs with the philosophy. And so although they've said, here's the new platform and it's, you know, going to charge at this speed, I think they do that for more consumer language. So, you know, plug in for this many minutes and get this much range. But we know that battery technology is improving all the time. So th th this is a platform, right? So this is about standardization and modularization. And so one of the, the, the huge things for me is that actually this is their future. This is their roadmap. Now, re important to remember, all of their cars so far have been compromised cars, which is sometimes easy to forget because they're so crazy efficient. They're some of the best out there, like the Ionic, right. uh, even the Nero and the Kona. In, in electric variants, it's just witchcraft. They go too far. And uh, for what, you know, for the electricity they use. But um, but they are compromised cars. This is the first time that they've done it with a dedicated platform. And whilst they've got some good specs, that's all great. The key is here that they are using, it's in terms of supply chain management and, you know, uh, c calling up, you know, Dave's seat company or whatever. Can we get 10 of those? Can we get a million of those? It's a different conversation. So it's really important that, 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 that car makers do this because it means they can launch models much quicker and it means that there's a much bigger range. And it means that in 2025, that we have millions of EVs on the roads rather than hundreds of thousands. So the specs are good, but don't get too tied up on it because battery technology chemistry is improving all the time. Uh, the vehicle sure. to load thing, they call it V2L or vehicle to load, or whatever, is really interesting because at the minute, if you want to get juice out of a car, normally a Chadamo car, um, there's the, the wall boxes at the minute are two, three thousand pounds. They're crazy expensive, but Lucid have done this, and now Hyundai and more will follow where all of the electronics are integrated into the car for the bi directionality. And so, no real purpose for that yet, but we will it will be used especially when you haven't got to stick a three thousand pound wall box on your house to you know to, to tar charge up your home battery um when all that's integrated we will find uses sure yeah well uh, one last thing about this i wanted to mention that the uh so some a lot of or some owners have had of the uh Kona Electric and Nero EV have had problems with the motors and uh, gearboxes and things. We're not exactly sure what, the, uh, but, they're, but they're being swapped out. You know, fairly, uh, you know, significant percentages of people have have had issues. So with this new platform, they've integrated the the axles into the. Uh, oh, I'm not sure how they call it now. The integrated axle, something they have. They have a. An acronym for it and everything and you know it looks great and it should fix up those problems um except that you know, if there is an issue with your axle man it's, it's going to be a expensive to have it replaced i think but anyway that's the maybe inside down the road kind of thinking i just saw that integrated axle it's like it's kind of nice but also more expensive to service i think but yeah so but moving along we have some more news uh GM, General Motors, and Nikola have signed an MOU, that's a Memorandum of Understanding, that supersedes and replaces the transaction announced on September the 8th of 2020, which was a deal for GM to buy into them and then build electric pickup trucks called the Badger for Nikola and put the uh, GM's hydrotech fuel cell technology into uh Nikola's transport trucks uh, and also the Altium batteries into the electric versions of uh, Nikola's transport trucks. Well, forget all about that. Yeah, the uh, the Badger is dead. I'm afraid to say. Um, yeah, and that deal is pretty much dead. And they have a they've settled on a memorandum of understanding, which to me is like the lowest level of of. <laughs> Of any, of any kind of a deal, you know, it's basically, you know, we. <laughs> it's not even a prenup. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> I feel bad for all of the uh, Nicola Badger reservation holders that were convinced yeah. that they were going to get their truck. They were so into these things, and we were all like, "Look, you're probably not going to get it." And there yeah, you go, I, not going to get it. I, I want to say, I was, I, I, uh, Jim should list the names of their attorneys that did the due diligence. So we all should know never to contact these people for any work because uh, how did they not do due diligence on, on, on Nicola? And, and uh, I mean, you know, how did they do their, you know, investigation said, Oh yeah, this is a company we should partner with. How does that happen? You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, uh, that, that GM's got 
a tremendous amount of egg on their face. In the beginning, we we were looking at it and saying, well, GM has nothing to lose about this because they're not investing any money and they're going to get the ZEV credits from the sales. And geez, GM was brilliant with this. What a, what a good deal. But <laughs> now, now we realize why it wasn't a good deal. They actually look pretty foolish. This is like, this is like seeing Brad Pitt on a dating app and, you know, and then when you actually meet them in person, I turn up and it's at that point that you go, this is different, right? At the point of believing what Trevor said, and then you actually do the due diligence and you go, hang on a minute, for years you've been saying that you've got all your own technology, you've got all your own IP, you've got, you don't need anybody else. Nikola's going to dominate and show Tesla how it's done. And by the way, we're the best thing ever. And then the deal is announced where, GM would build the factory, would build the car, would supply everything, and Nicola were going to just do the marketing and, and sell the thing. At that point, you go, well, the last three years have been BS, uh, but at no point did GM go, oh, hang on a minute. That's not Brad Pitt. That's the guy from the podcast. No, I'm walking away. So we were Catfish. so... Catfish. <laughs> totally. We were so confused by this, and, and how that few weeks must have gone for GM in the background of them going, what have we done? So this new agreement, Memorandum of Understanding, uh, is just uh, something that they could do to let the next three to four months go by, and then it will quietly go away. And Nicola, if anything, will be a small-scale commercial truck uh, development company until something happens there. But their mainstream vehicle isn't there. And without a mainstream vehicle, they aren't really worthy of, you know, the discussion level that they get right so this this kind of takes a, a good proportion of, of whatever wind uh, nicola had in its sales out of them um i haven't checked their stock price in a day or two but it was it had gone it down, down significantly it went down at the announcement and it went back up again because it's being traded so it's being traded by people uh who are making a uh you know either day trades or or they're, they're trading the stock there's it, it, it went down 20%, right. then 16%. It was like two days in a row. But then it went back up again. And you're like, well, what's... I did this it. is now... Ah. I, don't, I don't understand. It's all smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Sometimes stocks would do weird things, man. I've seen some like zombie stocks go on for years. And I have, I have like, like a little uh, emails, whatever, a, a little transaction happened with whatever stock from like, I don't know. It's a penny. It was a penny stock years ago. And it's like, you know, Fractions of a penny stock now, but it doesn't die. But anyway, uh, so yeah, let's move on to something it's, else. It's up over the exciting. month. Month on month, still up. Anyway, good luck if you're an investor wow. or you yeah, work there, Well, 18, or $18, that's eighteen yeah, ninety. Yeah, that's that's pretty low though, because it had been up to almost what for almost forty dollars at some point. Yeah, and then earlier in the year it was crazy high. Um, but um, but yeah, uh, you know if you are working at the company and you've got you know stock options and that's part of your you know your future and that's it sucks it sucks for them can i bring up something really quick uh yeah. you know the start of all of this was sure. from hindenburg's research uh firm was really like yeah. the first right and they just went after candy so uh my little right, fun car true. my my favorite vehicle of the year uh you know doesn't sound like it's gonna happen as much as it did when uh back then i mean of course they're saying uh, stuff on the financial back end, which I am not briefed on. I won't speak to, but I know that they did not renew their contract with their PR firm uh, last week because I got an email from them saying, hey, sorry, we no longer represent Candy anymore. So you'll have to just reach out to the CEO uh, of uh, Candy right. America. And uh, yeah, I was supposed to have a meeting with him, ask him all these questions about the cars. Uh, when are we going to get it? Is it going to be something we can actually drive? Uh, and I guess now they're going to have neighborhood electric vehicle versions, which is limited top speed, um, which I don't right. think need to go through any homologation or crash testing and uh, sort of not mm -hmm. looking so great. And so I'm hoping they can turn it around because, again, I, I, like Tom and I said, we're getting one if we can buy one and uh, we're going to do some fun things with it. But at this point, we're not even sure if we can get it. Hmm. Well, keep us up. Keep us up to date on what happens there. That's uh, that's kind of bizarre. So, uh, Mini has teased a spicy version of the Cooper SE. No, no details yet, but it just so happens that uh, Out of Spec just released a video about tracking the regular Cooper SE. So maybe he can tell us what this car needs to be a 
true track star. I think we have some footage of it, uh, Martin. It's got like the huge wing on the back. It's on the Nurburgring. Kyle, what's it? What does this car need to do to make it worthy of that big wing? Well, for those who don't know, I'm the biggest mini fan out there. Uh, Tom also, as part of the mini electric story from the beginning, actually, he was one of the drivers of the original yep. mini E. And uh, so Tom's been very influential in their BMW groups program on designing and engineering and ultimately what's become of the mini Cooper SE, which uh, we had brought over to our track in North Carolina. And Tom and I spent some time on track with that car and we ran into a couple problems. I think the chassis is set up, of course, for daily driving driving. I have a full track review up on auto spec reviews. And we also uh, found that that car had a lot of thermal limitations when driving aggressively. So uh, I'm an ex mini John Cooper works GP owner. I had a R56 generation car. This is the F56, the next generation. And now it is electric. If they make this car, it will be in my driveway. Uh, this is everything I love about motoring because it's premium they're designed and engineered by really really talented engineers and it's going to be electric and it's the fast one i just i love everything about it you can see my mini posters here i have a, a mini shrine yeah. over there and uh finally we get the jcw gp going electric hopefully we'll see this come to production again i'm not sure how many people are like me out there but i do know that this would be a great story for electric cars all around to have a hot hatch that's truly a hot hatch uh, that would be right. electrified. All, all, literally, it's made for me. So, it, but it needs a lot more cooling. Yeah, it needs more cooling for sure, and it needs faster, probably a little bit more range. I don't know if you just burn through the battery so fast on track that uh, I, yeah. I doubt you could do two laps of the Nurburgring on a full charge. Maybe two, but but nothing more. Uh, not that I am going to take my U.S. car around the Nurburgring, but I will take it around our tracks here and. Uh, We'll see. I just think if they can solve the cooling, that's a good first step. Put on the same suspension that's right. on the normal JCW GP and shred it. See, look, we're looking at the grill there. It doesn't look like it opens. Like it doesn't look like it has like flaps that open. You know, if you need more cooling, let more air in. So that's kind of bizarre. Well, uh, yeah, also the, the, the mini rear SE, diffuser. The, it didn't even kick on the fans. So it's there's there's potential to cool things more. And I don't think it's the battery that gets hot. I think it's the stator. Uh, I think it's uh, in the motor itself. In the uh, motor. Yeah, yeah. It, it really just uh, spikes in temperature when you drive it hard. And there's no way to actually jam cooling right to that part. So it needs probably a redesigned right. motor. Right. Man. That's, hmm. Oh, man. Don't disappoint us, BMW, who owns Mini. Uh, also, the, if you look at the rear diffuser on this, has a, like the little cutout for the exhaust pipes in the, the center center exhaust pipes. <laughs> oh yeah, look, it's at that. the same yeah. one from the from the gas version, just on this. Yeah, hopefully they'll uh, have an actual electric vehicle diffuser on the back of that because that helps. That's a that's a you know an element that really helps reduce uh, uh, friction, air friction helps with the aerodynamics and increase range. So that's, or put you know, one of those little one F1 of brake lights address. down there it would be right. kind of cool. Oh yeah, exactly. Right. I just, I just hope Mini does it right. I hope they don't just, you know, put stickers on it and give it fender flares and, you know, tweak a couple of things here and there and shave, you know, three tenths of a second off of the Cooper SE's zero to 60 time and say, Oh, here we go. Here's our performance version. You know, I, I, there's so much potential for a, a, a hot hatch, all electric Mini Cooper there. It, it, it's, I tell you, you know, Kyle mentioned earlier, I had the original Mini E. I drove it for two and a half years. I love that car. It's what hooked me on electric drive. And the, it's such a great platform for electrification. Mini should be an all electric brand. Uh, you know, I know they're eventually going to be. Uh, it, it just, yeah. it, it lends itself to it perfectly. I think BMW is, is waiting till, you know, battery density gets a little bit better. So, don't forget, it's a very small package, so it's hard to put a big enough battery in there to make it go 200, 250 miles or, or, or so, whatever they deem to be the minimum of what you know a, a Mini would have to be able to do to do road trips and so forth and so on. But it's, I tell you, Minis are perfect cars for, for, for electrification. They're city cars. 
the 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 go kart handling. It's you're right down on the road. That instant torque makes the car feel even faster because you're sitting so low. And that's what that's really what like, like I said what what hooked me on electrification. Do this right, many please. If you're gonna do this, make it a real hot hatch. That's that that can deal with the, the the thermal issues that the Cooper SE has and give us something that, you know, people want to drive, not just, you know, it's not a sticker car where you just took an SE and put some stickers on it and fender flares and said, oh, here it is. Uh, do this one right and, and people will buy it. And then make that convertible that you showed us a couple of years ago. Well, I'm, I'm still exactly making a mini for not making the <laughs> Rocket Man, the uh, ro the mini Rocket Man electric concept that they introduced, like back in like I don't know 2012, 2013. Yeah, I think it was like, like 13, 14. Yeah, Martin might be able to pull right. that up. That, that that would have been such a cool vehicle. That could have been okay. in production by now, and I think people would have loved it. That was a convertible, right? Rocket Man. The Rocket Man. I don't think the Rocket Man was a convertible. Oh, that was yeah. the small city car. You're thinking of the oh, yeah, the, the, concept oh, thing. Oh, God, what was the name of it? Um, uh, it, had, yeah, it super, well, I think the point yeah, is while you're thinking about that. Uh, was the, uh, yeah, the Super, super Legera or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, I'm talking about the Rocket Man, which was just a small version of the of, of a Cooper hardtop. And it was going to be all right. electric, and uh, it looked so cool. Look, I think Mini's at yeah. its weakest right now. We see uh, – aging products the f56 chassis has been out since 2014 now uh we don't see uh, a, a sales numbers increasing the countryman's okay but it's not amazing i think uh right now is probably the softest point for mini and they've always been about the driving enthusiast uh thing so if they can become and position themselves as the enthusiast uh, back road blaster of the electric car world cultivate the mini culture once again around that car do those fun road trip rally things like i did mini takes the states a number of times growing cross, cross country with six thousand mini coopers uh you know if they can get the brand back to that point with electric vehicles uh i think that's right. the way to go but right now we've just seen really a compliance effort for the mini cooper se it's an okay car but it's not an amazing ev and uh they, they better knock it out of the park with this gp if they bring it to production so is this on a new platform kyle uh, it's going to be on the same platform uh, based off the concept it's the f56 ice platform that has been adapted to a battery electric. Uh, it sounds like they're extending that chassis as well for cost. Uh, they're gonna run that for the next few years, which is fine. Like the gas cars drive really nicely. There's probably not much they could do yeah. to make them drive better uh, with the current chassis. I've done probably 100,000 miles in F56 chassis now across a whole bunch of cars. And uh, well, maybe not that many, maybe 50,000. But um, it, they're just a little soft. That's you know we missed the days of the R53, the supercharger wine, the real hardcore bouncy, you know, hard rock hard suspension. We just need that, but electrified, and uh, that that will be the right. feature of Mini. Otherwise, I don't know what's going to happen to them because at this point they're so yeah. expensive. And the supercharger wine is going to only going to happen when you're when you're actually like charging it up, but um, right. <laughs> so, so what what many needs then it basically is a is a new platform that's you know engineered to be electric, as you know if they want to keep any legacy in, uh, ice stuff for a while I'm sure how that will continue to sell for them if they have like a good EV but definitely that looks like what the seems to be what they really need it's like a platform they can shove a they lot just of batteries need to go into. All in. Mini right. hasn't gone in and all in and anything. They're taking all their BMW parts over and they've softened up the cars. Uh, and so now they're just kind of lukewarm water. They need to be spicy, put some Sriracha in there and uh, make it fun. Right on. Um, okay. So let's move on to a, net, a couple of, yeah, we're really over time now. Uh, so Ford is expected to produce an MEB based EVs in Cologne, Germany. So the MEB, MEB platform is from Volkswagen. And um, Ford is making a, a vehicle on the Volkswagen platform. And there's a possibility now that there might be a second vehicle coming for it as well, because they're not sure they're going to have the volume with just one vehicle. And I believe it's only going to be for Europe as well, which is really disappointing. I don't know. Yeah, anyone hearing anything about that? Just, yeah, I, I did read that this week. It was um, one of the senior manage, managers at Ford saying it, it wasn't a confirmation, but when the, the journalist put the question of will there be more, 
it was one of those answers of well if you want scale you have to do more so a kind of right you know, implicit yes so uh, but it would make sense it would make sense to um uh, to, if they're going to convert the cologne factory to make meb cars vw will be happy more license fees and uh, you know and ford uh, can you know can stave off some of those uh, CO two fines that some of the European you know car makers in Europe, uh, which are going to get more stringent through the decade, uh, they need, they all need to avoid it. But I just why wouldn't you make global cars? I don't understand. I, I, don't, I don't know enough about yeah. the automotive industry for them to say, well, it's a European only car. If it's a great car, why can it not be made at some of their US plants? Right, a scale well, is so important, know. and it's. You know, yeah. bring the prices down where people can afford them. I mean, you know, scale is like a big thing and only selling, you know, this in Europe, you know, this is, you know, Tom was giving Ford lots of kudos for their electric electrification program. But I think mm. personally, this is where I think they fall down uh, a bit, you know, that like the Mustang Mach-E platform seems to be, you know, pretty good, you know, pretty happening. So why don't. You know, I think they have one other vehicle that's going to use that platform, you know, earmarked right now. And then they have the MEB and then they have the the transit, you know, platform. It's mm. kind of scattered around a bit. You know, it's not uh, focused on a single platform or a single architecture like the way GM is doing it. Uh, GM has like a few different platforms maybe, but they have the same same motors and batteries going to be going in all of that, that Ultium branded uh, thing. Uh, yeah. So we're pretty much out of time, I think. I don't know if anyone had anything else they wanted to say about that. Nope, we're good. Okay. Uh, but before we go, I also wanted to mention that Lucid Motors has completed their a AMP-1 plant uh, with a production capacity of 30,000 vehicles. So, you know, kudos to Lucid for hanging in there and getting to this stage. Uh, it's going to be great to see how that develops over this next little bit. Um, and the Volkswagen i6 ID6 has been spied with minimal camo and it looks like a long wheelbase ID4. So that's, uh, I don't know if you can pull up a picture of that real quick, the ID6 Volkswagen, which we don't haven't really heard anything about. I'm not sure which, if that's based on the rooms concept or which concept that's based on anyone know offhand? Nope. No, okay. not that one, no. Uh, yeah, it looks like a decent, uh, what, what is that anyway, like a crossover station wagon thing? Yeah, kind of people carrier kind of thing. Yeah, it's all, it's all right. We'll see how that develops. It's kind of hard to get the, a real good feel for the character the way it is now. Some of that, that fascia is probably not going to look like that in the future. Some, in, just but, some uh, interesting uh, politics to throw in uh, this week on, on Volkswagen Group. Uh, the main man at the, the oh, top yeah. of the company asked the company to back him. Um, not a kind of back me or sack me uh, ultimatum, but such are the fights uh, keeps getting voted down by the enormous uh, pressure that uh, the German unions have and the, uh, the the kind of worker representation. They hold so many votes on the board at the uh, group level. He's becoming increasingly frustrated. Even wrote for, I think it was Handelsblatt, or he wrote for someone, a newspaper, uh, did an opinion piece on the struggles he's having and just says, look, if this company doesn't make tough decisions, which means reducing the workforce numbers, 600,000 yeah. 600, plus people work for the company, um, then... Uh, he's got no interest in, you know, in just having fights for the next few years. So that uh, is unresolved right now. But it's uh, VW have got it all going on. I think we're all fans of what they're doing. It's one to watch. Without him at the top of the company, it would be a different story. Yes, definitely. Uh, and also, he's uh, putting Audi at the center of the electrification efforts. So I think a lot of the Audi, the Audi brand, will be developing a lot of the technology, and then the other. Mm -hmm. Uh, Volkswagen brands will you know, feed off of that. So that's kind of a big strategy change as well for the VW group. Mm. Yeah, and, you know, and he's, and he's, with like the, he's the moving One force behind that, that as well. Hmm. Audi pulled out of um, Formula yeah. E. Yeah, and yeah that's kind of bizarre, right? Which is, which is weird that they're, they're going to be focused on the performance, you know, uh, electric brand of Volkswagen group, yet they're pulling them out of, uh, well, Porsche is the ultimate performance, but um, but they've pulled out well, of the Formula Volkswagen E. Pulled out. So that, so that uh, uh, announcement was made by Audi. The following day, VW Motorsport announced that, mo that Volkswagen are pulling out of all motorsport in the future. So there's 170-odd employees of, mo of Volkswagen Motorsport, the company. They will be, everything they've learned from running things like the IDR up, 
Pikes Peak, Goodwood, etc., will be folded into the bigger company. They're not losing that knowledge, but they are pulling all of their motorsport activities as a group and investing it in EV technology. That's how serious they are about EVs. Yeah, they should just stick that with making EV motorsports, yeah. though. Yeah, you yeah, learn so be. much yeah. out in the real world. Uh, you, you can't, like, as a big company, it, it's not from a public perspective, from my perspective, fan of racing, that's no way to do it. You just push, you know, the the racing division always leads the company in what you're working on. So push the front line of electric technology out there in the series. We know, um, you know, some rally series are going full electric here just in 2022. So let's get into that that's instead of just so stopping few, all the I know, it's 170 activity. people, you know, that's salaries I, and, you know, people who right. run the program and R&D, but still... It's surely that's not the biggest expense that VW could save in order to plow money into to EVs. And as Kyle says, it's not about the brand or the marketing and, and going racing and, you know, people watching it on Sunday and buying a car on a Monday. It's about what you learn as well and, and pushing things forward. So super that was kind of super surprising. Look at Lucid, for instance, with their battery packs. That you know, they yeah. they, they went. Well, to, to we've, develop we're way over time their, here. Oh, um, I'm having some. A, a yeah, yeah, well, Dom. I'm having some technical oh. issues here. We may be losing Dom. But, but yeah. uh, I can. Uh, <laughs> oh no! Yeah, we went on for too long. Dom's his, his laptop is Dom's falling apart. It's like, out. come on, guys, <laughs> it get says, off. Look, get off. <laughs> You've done enough. There's for smoke me. billowing out here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think it's working now. If you have any comments about uh, any of the, any of the topics on today's show, uh, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post, the YouTube comments section, or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. Don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Tom Logney is at Tomalog. Martin Lee is at at, at EV News Daily. And Kyle Connor is at Out of Spec. I'm Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all next week. Ciao.